Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Olivia de Havilland and Herbert Marshall in Vigil in the Night with Helen Chandler. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When you or I enter a hospital, we generally are more anxious to get out than we were to get in. And that leaves us no time to look for a story. It may not even occur to us that the hospital contains a story. Yet, the best one of all, a love story, happens there more often than you might think. And one such love story is Vigil in the Night, a play that takes us through a hospital's calm outer corridors into the lives of the men in white and the women in white. We bring you Olivia de Havilland as a nurse who sacrifices her own professional standing for the sake of someone she loves. And Herbert Marshall as a doctor to whom an affair of the heart is, <laughs> well, something that doesn't always require a stethoscope. This is the first time we've had Olivia on this stage in more than a year, and it's a good chance to congratulate her again on her fine performance as Melanie in Gone with the Wind. Proving her versatility, she comes to us this week from Warner Brothers Studio, where she's playing a very different role as a violinist in the picture episode. I think you'll agree that Herbert Marshall, in the part of Dr. Prescott, is just what the doctor ordered. Vigil in the Night is adapted from the RKO motion picture, based on the novel by A.J. Cronin, a doctor as well as an author, who is entirely at home in our hospital setting. In a well-organized hospital, work is done with a streamlined touch, and clever women run their homes the same way, with the help of Lux Flakes. They've found that good management doesn't need luck as much as it needs Lux. But now we've an appointment to keep. A vigil in the night, and the curtain rises on act one of our play, starring Olivia de Havilland as Anne Lee, Herbert Marshall as Dr. Prescott, and Helen Chandler as Lucy Lee. The isolation ward of the Sherham Hospital in England few hours before dawn. In the dreary quiet of the night, a child fights for life against the ravages of laryngeal diphtheria. A tiny silver tube has been inserted into his throat, a lifeline bringing air to tortured lungs. By the bedside sits a nurse. Every so often she leans forward and carefully clears the tube when it becomes blocked. The hours pass slowly. And little by little, the nurse's eyes close in sleep. But now the tube is blocked. The lifeline shut off. The boy fights for air, unable to call out. And then, the battle is over. Death has won again. The nurse awakens quickly, stares horrified at the bed. Anne! Anne! Lucy, what's the matter? Anne! Anne, he's dead. What happened? Lucy, tell me. Well, the tube, it, it was blocked. I was asleep. Oh, Anne. Stop it. Stop it. Now, get hold of yourself. But it was my fault. I killed him. I killed that baby. Lucy, I... listen to me. You weren't on duty, do you understand? I relieved you an hour ago. I was on duty when he died. You don't know anything about it. No! Do what I say. Now, go to your room. Stay there. I'll come to you later. <laughs> Come now, nurse. I expect to be answered. I must know how the tube became blocked. Were you the nurse on duty? Yes, I was. I thought your sister Lucy was supposed to be on last night. Yes, matron, but uh, my sister had a headache and I relieved her. And how did the tube become blocked? Well, matron... Yes, what is it, nurse Greg? I've just found out something you ought to know. Tea has been made in the ward kitchen. Nurse Lee, did you make tea in the kitchen when you should have been attending to your patient? Yes. I... I felt sure he'd be all right, but when I came back, he was dead. Nurse Lee, you of all people, it's... it's almost... You may well search for a word, matron. There isn't one to fit it. 
A human life has been lost, wantonly thrown away through gross and utter negligence. Dr. Hassel, Mrs. Ward is here. Last night I told her her boy would recover. What can I tell her now? You will leave the hospital at once. And remember, Nurse Lee, wherever you go, there is nothing in the world so bad as a bad nurse, nor so good as a good one. Remember it all your days. You may go now. Anne! Anne! Wait! Anne! Weren't you going to see me before you leave? Of course, Lucy. But where are you going? I'm catching the 8.30 train. I thought I'd try for a place at Hepperton. Oh, but Anne, I don't know why I ever let you take the blame for what I did. How can you ever forgive me? You're my sister. We've got to help each other if we can. Oh, Anne, I'm not cut out to be a nurse. I'm just weak and selfish. Don't I... say that. But it's true. I'm not like you. I, I'm only human. Oh, Anne, this isn't the wonderful work you told me it would be. Polishing, scrubbing, cleaning up slops. It's slavery. Lucy, how can you talk like that? Well, I'm not going to stand for it. I'm going to take the blame and go to London. I've always wanted to go to London. Next month, when you get your certificate, we'll both go to London. Lucy, I didn't take the blame just to be heroic. I have my certificate. I can go somewhere else. You'd never have received yours. Next month, when you have it, you can join me. Oh, yes, Anne. But there's something I want you to promise me. Yes? Never be careless. Let the memory of what happened last night keep you a good nurse. I promise. Goodbye. Goodbye, Anne. Goodbye. Nurses. Strong young nurses wanted. Hepperton Institution. Apply Miss East. Matron. Your name is Anne Lee? Yes, matron. Here's my certificate. Three years at Chirame. Eh? Just got qualified and then cleared out. Bit the hand that fed you. Well, I know what ingratitude is. I've had it all my life. I thrive on it. I took a year of surgery at Chirame. And... Never mind that. Ever been ill in your life? No, matron. Good. I also have honours. Never and... mind that either. You look strong. That's the important thing. Hepburn isn't the finest hospital in England, and I dare say I'm not its most lenient matron. I stand no nonsense, and I offer no favouritism. You're entitled to one half a day a week off if you're lucky, extra duty if you're not. No smoking, no cosmetics, and share a bedroom with two other girls. Those are the conditions. If they're not to your liking, I'd appreciate your stepping out now rather than wasting your time and mine. I hope you'll be happy here. Thank you, matron. I'll do my best I'm to... sure you will. Your room is Nurse Dunn and Nurse Phillips and be ready for duty at 6 p.m. Next, please. Who's next? Don't keep me waiting all day. Step up here. Come in, Nurse Lee. My name's Lenny. Her name's Nora. Mine's Anne. How do you do? Hello. That's your bed over there. It looks hard and it feels hard, but don't let it fool you. It <laughs> is hard. <laughs> I'm used to that. And here's our wash basin. The tap on the right is cold water and the tap on the left is cold water. Repeat every day for the first two weeks. A cockroach is not a dangerous insect. And you may get to like this room. <laughs> I hope I'll suit you as much as the last girl did. That won't be hard. She was a mess. Say, Nora, you better get ready for duty. It's almost 5.30. 5.30? Oh, maybe I've missed him. No. Oh, here he comes now. What's that all about? Shh. It's a man. Every day at 5.30 sharp, Dr. Prescott goes down the walk and Nora watches him from the window. Her contact with him is entirely mental. How about the day you swallowed two pounds of grapes and the seeds, hoping to follow your appendix so Prescott would operate? I ate those seeds because I was hungry. Prescott's the house surgeon? That's right. I'd like to work in surgery. Who wouldn't, my dear? Who wouldn't? Look at him. Straight and tall and bright as... As bright as chilled steel, only tougher. Steel melts at 2,000 degrees. Prescott wouldn't. Is he really a good man? They don't come any better. Wait till you meet him. Nurse. Nurse. Yes, doctor. Didn't you hear me call the first time? Yes, sir. I was taking a temperature. I'm Dr. Cayley, the resident medical officer. I have things to do, you know, and I can't stand around waiting for nurses. You won't have to wait for me, now, sir. No impertinence. Take these x-ray plates into Dr. Prescott. At once, please. Dr. Prescott? Yes, sir. Dr. Prescott? Just a moment, please. All right now, Johnny. Walk over there to your father. But I can't walk. 
But I say you can, Johnny. You can walk. All you need to do is try. Now, come on. I can't. I can't. Oh, yes, you can. Now, you look here. I've got a surprise for you. See what's behind the screen, Johnny? A train. It's yours, Johnny. Now, walk over here and play with it. Come on. A train? Come on, Johnny. It's mine? All yours. Come on. Mine? A train? That's the boy. That's right. Keep going. Fine. Doctor, he's walking. God bless you, Doctor. It's all right. I think he's going to be all right now. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. You can take him home now. Good morning. Come, Johnny. Come along, son. Look, Daddy, my train. Well, nurse, what is it? Oh, uh, these plates from Dr. Cayley. Oh, yes, let me see them. That... That was very remarkable, Dr. Prescott. Hmm? What? That little boy. Making him walk. Hysteria. Needed a push. That'll be all, nurse. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello, surgery. Get the theater ready at once from an abdominal. Matthew Bowley is coming in. Acute appendix. See that everybody's on the alert. Nurse Wilde, clear the private ward near the solarium. Mr. Bowley's coming in. But, Matron, Mr. Hall's in there. Move him. Give Mr. Bowley a special nurse the moment he arrives. Yes, Matron. The rush, Wild. It's a sensation. Matthew Bowley's appendix backed up on him. We're operating in the theater. Matthew Bowley? Who's Bowley, Glennie? He's the chairman of the board that runs this place, and he has all the money in Manchester. It's a wonder they bring him to a hospital like this. Prescott, that's why. Prescott's going to operate. Let's go and watch. Mm, all right, but I once coughed while Prescott was operating. I might do it again. Come on, I've got to see Prescott work. No talking in the gallery, please. The patient is ready for you, Dr. Prescott. Scalpel. Scalpel. Swab. Swab. How is it, Prescott? Gallbladder is chronically inflamed. Have to do a complete resection. Scalpel. Scalpel. All through, Prescott? All over. Suit your matron. Suit your. Count the swabs, nurse. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All correct, Doctor. No. All correct, Doctor. They're not all there. Talking in the gallery, Nurse Lee, endangering the life of a patient, unforgivable breach of discipline. All correct, Doctor. Recount the swabs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <gasps> oh, one swab is torn in half, Doctor. It must be in the incision. Here it is. Ah, close call. Come in. Uh, come in, Miss Lee. Did you send for me, Mr. Bowley? Uh, good evening, my girl. I'm glad to see you. Uh, this is my son. Hello. What's your name? Matt Bowley II in Roman numerals. How do you do, Matt Bowley II in Roman numerals? My name is Anne Lee. How do you do, Anne Lee? Yeah, now, run along, son. Uh, uh, sit down, nurse. I'm going out tomorrow, uh, but I couldn't leave without having a look at you. I'd like to say that Matthew Bowley is apt to be more useful <laughs> without a swab of cotton sewed up inside of him. I'm inclined to agree, Mr. Bowley. You've got sense as well as beauty, and that's a mighty fine combination in a woman. I always say that if a man's got to be ill, it does him good to see a smart lass about the room instead of a long-faced female. Long-faced females can be excellent nurses, sir. Maybe, but not for Matt Bowley. Now, I'm not one to forget a good turn. And in the meantime, I, I want you to take this purse, uh, just as a souvenir of that missing swab. <laughs> oh, but, uh, Mr. Bowley... Nah, nah, not a word. Not one single word. Uh, you can thank me some other time. Hello, Matt. Oh, well... Hello, my dear. I've just come to take the boy home. Uh, 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 this is my wife, uh, uh, Nurse Lee. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> this is the uh, girl who spoke up, and I don't mind saying we're proper grateful, aren't we, love? Yes, properly grateful. Well, I must be going along now. Come along, Matt. Goodbye, Nurse Lee. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. I must be leaving, too. Uh, good night, Mr. Bowley. Uh, uh, good night. Nurse Lee, just a moment, please. Oh, Dr. Prescott. I've been wanting to speak to you, nurse. Dr. Prescott, 
I'm sorry about the other day in surgery. I just got in the habit of counting swabs. I'm afraid you committed the unforgivable. You've endangered the ethics of the medical profession. Your duty is to work 12 hours a day and serve the patient with every energy you possess. But you should never do anything for him that might be a breach of ethics. <laughs> I understand, Doctor. By the way, how much does Bowley value his life at? A new purse. Well, perhaps he's right. I didn't want to take it, sir. I know how you feel. Bowley's generosity is always embarrassing, but I wouldn't worry about it. After all, the laborer is worthy of his hire, and your help was worth a great deal. Thank you, Dr. Prescott. Good night. Nurse Lee, will you come, sir? Yes, matron. Nurse Lee, you know Nurse Gray. She's from Sherham Hospital. Nurse Gray. Good evening. I heard you were here. Miss Gregg has just joined our staff. She'll work with you for a while. I'm sure we'll get along. Did you find it hard to get a position after you left Cher and Nurse Lee? No, I didn't. Really? I had imagined that after... That's enough, please. I'm very busy. You may report for duty tomorrow, Nurse Gregg. Yes, Nathan. Thank you. Capable nurse, that? Yes, quite capable. Oh, Matron. Well? Matron, may I have tomorrow off? Tomorrow off? My sister's being qualified. She's getting her nurse's certificate tomorrow, and I promised I'd be there. Why couldn't she pick your day off to be qualified? Oh, very well. Go on. Oh, thank you, matron. You can ride with me. I'm going on the Sheeran bus as far as the city. Get your coat and meet me in ten minutes. Nasty night. I shall be soaked to the skin the minute I leave the bus. I wish the drive had slowed down. It's so slippery. Good evening, matron. May I sit here? Oh, hello. Certainly. Good evening, Nurse Lee. Good evening, Nurse Gray. Well, this is pleasant. Uh, going far, matron? I'm only going as far as the city. Nurse Lee's going to Sheeran. How nice. Well, this little ride will give us a chance to talk over old times, Nurse Lee. Over a cup of tea, as it were. Tell me, Nurse Lee, do you still crave tea and toast in the early morning? It does help one after a long night's duty, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You know, after you left, we had quite a few cases of laryngeal diphtheria. Like that little boy you nursed. Remember? Handsome little boy, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So you're going back to Sheeran. I should think that after what happened to Fella. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, matron, I feel that it's only right I should tell you that in the hospital one night, <laughs> no, me, me. <laughs> Get me out! Oh, can't somebody get me out? Nurse Lee, are you are you all right, Matron? My arm, nothing much. What about you? I'm all right, but Nurse Greg, I'm afraid she's badly hurt. Look at her. Lift her head. Huh? Fracture, I should say. Right over. Just get off the road. You there? Come here quickly. Yes, Miss. How far are we from Hepperton? Well, just about fifteen miles. Is there a doctor nearby? There's one at the village, Miss. Well, get him here and call the Hepperton Hospital. Tell them to send the ambulance and as many nurses as they can. And Doctor Prescott. Get Dr. Prescott. You have just heard Act One of Vigil in the Night with Olivia de Havilland, Herbert Marshall, and Helen Chandler. Before we go on with Act Two, there's something I want to say to women. You know, Mr. Ruick... When we have television on the Lux Radio Theater, your job will be easier than ever. How do you mean, Sally? Why, with television, you could illustrate all the things you say about new quick Lux by actually showing people what you meant. <laughs> you mean I could hold up a Lux flake so they could see how sheer and delicate it is? Oh, goodness, it's so sheer you can see through it. Why, you can even read type through a Lux flake. And what I meant was this. You could actually make suds right in front of the mic. People could see that New Quick Lux burst into studs with a touch of water. Yes, New Quick Lux is fast. In water as cool as your hand, it dissolves three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps tested. You could show them all that with television, and you could show them how much studs you get with just a few flakes. That's true, too. Ounce for ounce, New Quick Lux gives more suds than any of the other soaps tested, even in hard water. That's why we say, a little goes so far... Lux is thrifty. But there's one thing television wouldn't show. That's Lux purity. Now, what did we do about that? You don't have to do anything about that. Millions of women have made Lux the most popular care for fine fabrics in the country. They've done that because they know it's safe for everything safe in water alone. Washable colors and fabrics 
stay new looking longer with Lux. And that same marvelous purity is in new quick Lux. Well, there's one more thing we could do with television. We could hold up the Lux box to show women that new quick Lux comes in the same familiar package. Well, the easiest thing to do is to go to your dealers tomorrow and ask for new quick Lux. Use it for all your nice things. Your stockings, under things, your silks, rayons, woolens, and the lovely new cottons. It's fast, so thrifty, and so wonderfully gentle, yet it costs no more. And be sure to get the big package for extra economy. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Vigil in the Night, starring Herbert Marshall as Dr. Prescott and Olivia de Havilland as Anne Lee, with Helen Chandler as Lucy Lee. Far into the night, Nurse Lee and Dr. Prescott work side by side over the injured. By the light of an oil lamp in a farmhouse kitchen, an operating table has been hastily improvised, and bodies which were broken and torn are made whole again. Lives which hung precariously on the brink of existence are helped skillfully back into the world. Now the long night is almost over. Through the rain, Prescott and Anne drive slowly back toward the hospital, tired but victorious. That great woman was about the toughest of the lot. For a while, I thought we were going to lose her. I don't see how you operated in that light. I couldn't have done it at all without help. You were splendid, Nurse Lee. Thank you. And I'm, I'm glad she's going to pull through. Oh, I think she will. She's a nurse, didn't you say? Yes, I knew her at Sheeran. Oh, this isn't the hospital. No, it's my house. I thought you might like a drop of something to pick you up. Well, I, I should be getting back to the hospital. You know, I'll have to ring as it is. There's a window very easily opened at the back of the hospital. I remember it from my student days. Not that I ever used it, of course. <laughs> Hurry up, you'll be soaked. Good evening, Mrs. Merchant. You still up? You forgot your key. Oh, did I? Go in, Nurse Lee. Here, let me uh, take your things. This is Miss Lee, Merchant, one of our nurses. How do you do? Uh-huh. We'll have some sherry, please, Merchant. There's your tea on the table. Well, in that case, we'll have another cup. All hours of the night. No rest for anybody. Can't be a decent body, keep decent hours. Mrs. Merchant wishes to point the fact that I'm not in the habit of entertaining the nursing staff of the hospital. Here's the cup. Don't stay too long, please, Miss Lee. He has little enough sleep as it is. And don't let him start telling you about the new hospital, or you'll be up all night. Oh, go to bed, Merchant. We won't want anything. I inherited Merchant with the house. My mother left her to me in her will. <laughs> Sugar? Thanks. Dr. Prescott, what did she mean by a new hospital? Oh, Merchant's ears are too big. Nothing at all. She met a new hospital for Hepatin. She's right. Things are pretty bad. How do you mean? Oh, there's so much for everything else and so little for the sick. Huh? A very short but able description of things at Hepatin. We're working without motored equipment all the time. I've been fighting for a new and adequate hospital. I've argued, reasoned, and begged. This is an industrial community. More accidents, more occupational diseases, increases of infections due to the crowded areas. If you'd ever seen them die like I have, you'd argue and reason and beg too. And all with no result. And why? Because of one man, Matthew Bowley. All I get from him are promises. Promises and evasions and discussions of costs. <laughs> oh, well. Maybe I ought to save all this for the committee meeting instead of boring you with it. Well... Shall I take you to that window yet? Please. And you're going to get that new hospital. I know it. Well, gentlemen, Dr. Kelly's report shows that everything in the hospital is working very smoothly. Meeting adjourned, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman. Now, Prescott, if it's about the new hospital again some other time, Dr. Cayley's report... Dr. Is... Cayley's report rather glosses over the fact that in the past several weeks, any number of cases of cerebrospinal fever have broken out. Last year, we almost had an epidemic, you know. We were not fully equipped to fight it. This year, our position is no better. We're hopelessly overcrowded and constantly having to send cases out too soon in order to make room for others. And if we let one infectious case out, five will come back. You may be right, Prescott, but as far as I can see, catching a disease is providence. It's not providence, Mr. Bowley. It's just a dirty, murderous little microbe. Confine that microbe soon enough and long enough, 
and you'll save three times what is put into the new hospital. Now, look here, Prescott. Money isn't as easy to raise as it used to be. World conditions at the present time are pretty well upset. I understand that, Mr. Bowley, but regardless of world conditions, people still get ill. They still have babies, and they still get run over. And they come to us to take care of them. All right, Prescott, you mustn't be impatient. I'll do my best to raise the money. Will that satisfy you? How soon may we expect to hear the results of your efforts? Oh, well, give me a day or two. Meeting adjourned. Good morning, Nurse Lee. Good morning. Uh, matron said you wanted to see me, Mr. Bowley? Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, uh, sit down. Mr. Bowley, I must get back to my work as soon as possible. You know, that's a fine spirit. A clever girl like you ought to have a real chance. Now, the hospital's a dog's life. You, you should start a private home. There's pots of money in it if you have the proper backing. That's very easy to say, sir. Hmm. Would you ever think of applying to Mac Bowley? Why, uh, no, I... Uh... Why not? <laughs> I'm a very wealthy man, and it gives me great pleasure to lend a helping hand to a good cause. Well, there's no better cause than Hepperton, sir. Anything you'd give me could be far better used by Dr. Prescott for his new hospital. Ah, you too, eh? Mm -hmm. That Prescott must certainly have a way with the girls. Nonsense. He just happens to be a wonderful doctor. A great doctor. I'm sorry, my dear, but when I take a liking to someone, I'm a jealous little devil. And I've taken a liking to you. I'm afraid I'll have to go now. Oh, no, 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 please. I, I only meant that I want to help you. Mr. Bowley. If you really want to do something, why don't you help Dr. Prescott? Conditions in Hepperton are appalling. Would you really like me to help get Prescott's hospital for him? Yes, very much. Well, we'll see what can be done. You don't know how much it'd mean to him, Mr. Bowley. Oh, Anne, don't you think you ought to stop calling me Mr. Bowley? My name's Matty, you know. Matt for short. I'm a very lonely man, my dear. I've hesitated to speak about it before, but, well... You can see for yourself what the missus is. Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm not saying a word against her. I'm as loyal as any man could be. But the fact remains, I need younger companionship. A, a little lady friend, as you might say. Do you mind if I come in? Why? Martha. I've been standing just outside the door. Martha, Don't I bother was... to explain. As for you, young lady, the first time I clapped eyes on you, I knew what you were up to. Mrs. Bowler. You take advantage of a man's illness to worm your way into his affections and steal him from under his wife's nose. Now, look here, Martha. Be quiet. Robert... What kind of a fool are you to be taken in with such a baggage as that? She and her precious Dr. Prescott. He couldn't worm enough money out of you, so he put her on the job. Mrs. Bowley, Dr. Prescott had nothing to do with That's it. That's enough from you. I'll ask you to leave. I'll have my say with the matron, and you'll find yourself out of a job, my lady. Well, Mr. Bowley, what is it? Uh, mind if I sit down? Well, Prescott, <laughs> well, I just say you've heard a devil of a lot of talk going around the hospital this last couple of days. I couldn't help but hear it. You've had that girl dismissed, haven't you? Now, Prescott, I don't want you to get me wrong, so to speak, but, well, you know what women are, <laughs> especially the missus. Uh, I'd like to make my position clear. I think your position is abundantly clear. Now, look here, Prescott. You shouldn't take that attitude toward me after all I've done for the hospital. You've done the absolute minimum for this hospital. Now, that's not fair. I told you I'd do my best. Your best, unfortunately, consists of pestering a nurse with your unwelcome attentions. And that's one thing that's going to stop around here. Yes, but I've explained... I'm that... not interested in your explanations. The only service you could do the hospital would be to raise money. Since you can't be shamed into doing that, I'm going elsewhere for it. I'm going to London. You forget I'm chairman of the board. As far as I'm concerned, you're a pompous little man who'll be well advised to get out of this room before he's thrown out neck and crop. Oh, of course, if you feel like that. I do. Get out. Who is it? Oh, come in. I came to say goodbye, Doctor. I'm leaving Hepperton. I know. You made any arrangements for the future? I've had a letter from my sister. She's nursing again in London at the Rollgrave home. I thought perhaps I'd try to get a position there. The Rollgrave? I don't think that's the kind of place you'd care to work. Why? From all I've heard of the Rollgrave, it has none too savory a reputation. Yeah, I'll give you a letter of recommendation to a friend of mine in London. Thank you. Dr. Prescott. Yeah? I've been very worried by what's happened. I was afraid that you might think... Nurse Lee... I'm not particularly concerned with Mrs. Bowley's story, whether it's a fairy tale or not. But when I told you of my plans, I did feel that it was in confidence. Frankly, I didn't expect it would go any further. I'm terribly sorry. I realize now, as a nurse, I had no right to betray a professional confidence. 
I'm not quite sure you didn't anticipate that the result would be so seriously damaging to my plans. I have no wish that your good work here should go unrewarded. So if you'll give this letter to the matron of the Fargo Hospital, I'm sure you'll have no difficulty in finding a job. Thank you. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. Officer. Morning, miss. Officer, could you please direct me to the Rollgrave home? It's a hospital. The Rollgrave? Closed, miss. They won't let you in there. Closed? Why? You'd better buy a newspaper, miss. It'll tell you all about it. Death in Rollgrave home. Nurse held for questioning. Boy, give me a paper. Here you are, miss. Paper, suicide. The police are holding a nurse for questioning at the coroner's inquest. The nurse is Miss Lucy Lee of Sheeran. Lucy! Now, tell us, Miss Lee, in your own words, just what happened on the morning that Miss Dallas was killed. Well, Miss Dallas rang for me shortly after ten. She seemed nervous, and I gave her the usual injection of masonal. You say the usual injection. In other words, you'd been administering the narcotic to her since her arrival at the home. Well, yes, Dr. Andrews left orders for her to give me one grain whenever she seemed nervous. I see. So we are to understand that you administer the drugs without the knowledge of Mrs. Sullivan, the proprietress of the home? Well, no, not not exactly. I'm sure Mrs. Sullivan must know whenever a patient is given a narcotic. What uh, happened after you administered the masonel? Well, I, I left the room to sterilize the hypodermic, and I suddenly heard a shriek. I ran back, and Miss Dallas wasn't there. I heard a commotion outside and ran to the window. <laughs> you, uh, you looked out, and you saw the body lying on the pavement. You're excused. Next witness, Mrs. Sullivan, please. Anne. Oh, Anne. Shh. It's all right, Lucy. Sit here, dear. Yes. What are they going to do to me? Nothing, Lucy. They can't do anything. Yes, but I gave her the drug. I gave it to her. Lucy, it's Dr. Prescott. Hello. How's it going? We can't tell yet. This is my sister, Doctor. They say that she... Yeah, I know. I read about it in the paper. Have they questioned the Sullivan woman yet? She's just been called. Excuse me, I want to get permission to do a little questioning myself. See you later. And, and what is he going to do? I don't know, but I think he can help us. You are Mrs. Henrietta Sullivan, proprietress and matron of the Rollgrave Nursing Home? That is so. How long have you held this position? For the past two years. But I should like to say now that I had no idea the drugs were being administered to the patients by Dr. Andrews and Nurse Lee. Am I to understand you were not familiar with Dr. Andrews? No, I was not. Oh, I'd heard of him, of course. Unfortunately, Dr. Andrews cannot be located. Is there any further light you're able to throw on this fatality? I'm afraid not. Uh, may I be excused? One moment. May I question the witness, Mr. Coroner? This gentleman is Dr. Prescott of Hepatitis, sir. Oh. Very well, Doctor. Thank you. Mrs. Sullivan... I believe you testified that you knew Dr. Andrews by reputation only. That is so. Tell me, Mrs. Sullivan, you have other patients in your nursing home, I presume? Under whose care are they? There are eight other patients, and they are under my care. No. No, you must understand me, Mrs. Sullivan. I mean, which doctor looks after them? They brought in their own doctors. But surely these questions have nothing to do with Miss Dallas. Would you be good enough to name any doctor brought in by any of these patients? I don't remember for the moment. Well, perhaps I can help you. Was Dr. Andrews brought in by any of these patients? He might have been. You must answer yes or no, Mrs. Sullivan. Well, yes. By how many of them was he brought in? I don't know. Was he not brought in by each and every one of them? Mr. Coroner. Furthermore, isn't it true that you ran a nursing home in Leamington five years ago and that you found it advisable to leave when the local nursing association began to investigate? In other words, Mrs. Sullivan, under the guise of running a nursing home, you have been selling and administering drugs to addicts for, the, for at least five years. Oh. Order! Order, please! Order! Have you no answer to these charges, Mrs. Sullivan? I'm not on trial. I should like to speak to my counsel. Everything I have said can be substantiated, Mr. Connor. It will be a simple matter to prove that the nurse, Miss Lee, administered the drug in performance of her duty and at the express instruction of Dr. Andrews and Mrs. Sullivan. Consequently, no guilt should be attached to her. I'm sure the jury will agree. Thank you for your help, Doctor. <laughs> Nursing will be all right, but as soon as I started to work there, 
I knew I was doing the wrong thing. Oh, Anne. Shh, it's all over, darling. You weren't to blame at all. The jury said so. Oh, Dr. Prescott, I don't know how to thank you. Don't try. Exposing Mrs. Sullivan was a pleasure. Lucy, don't, darling. I'm a bad nurse, Anne. After that terrible thing that happened at Sherham, I wanted to do better, but now I'll never get a chance again. You're just not a nurse, darling. I've influenced you wrongly. I should never have insisted. Now, please don't cry. Come on, look up here. That's the girl. You listen to your big sister, Lucy. She's a pretty smart girl. Well, I've got to be getting back to Hepperton. I suppose you heard about the epidemic. No. Cerebrospinal? Yes. 30 cases and more coming in every day. Oh, that's horrible. What are you doing? It's not doctoring they need so much. It's room for the poor devils when they come in. Supplies, isolation, and plenty of the right care all the time. Matron's having a job getting volunteers for isolation. Can't say I blame the nurses much. It's not a pretty disease. Doctor, I'd like to go. No, Lucy. Anne, I'd like to really. Why don't you let her, Anne? It might be a good opportunity for her to forget all this. No. I want Lucy to stay with me. Oh, but Anne, no decent place in London would take me after this. That's true, Anne. Oh, please, I know I can do it, and do it well. I'm sure you can. All right. I'll go with you. You? But I don't think you... You mean after the way I left, they wouldn't want me? Oh, I'm sure they'll take me back in isolation. I can't do much damage there. Besides, it's my work. It's what I want to do. But, Anne, nursing isn't your entire life, is it? Why, yes. I thought you knew. Oh, of course, I'm an idiot not to have seen that. Quiet, please. Nurses, I'm not going to waste words. I've had to call you together again from the same reason. Things have become far more serious. We require volunteers to go across the court. Those willing to work in isolation ward, please stand up and step forward. Nurses, I'm very disappointed at this lack of response. Why is it? Why? I'll tell you, matron. Well, Nurse Dunn. You're asking us to go across the court and risk our lives. Why should we? Conditions here are bad enough. We work ourselves to the bone for rotten food and rotten pay and no thanks. And then when there's an even dirtier job to be done, we are asked to come forward and volunteer. Well, I, for one, would rather chuck up the job and work as a scullery maid. That's enough. I take it then that there are no volunteers. That is all. You can go back to your duties. Matron! Matron! Anne! Anne Lee! Hello, Matron. This is my sister Lucy. We're a couple of strong girls. We've never been ill in our lives, and we're reporting for duty. Duty? We've come to work in isolation, if you'll have us. If I'll have you! Anne, you know what it means. For every patient who dies in there, there are two waiting to take his place. And once you're in, there's no getting out, unless you're lucky. We're nurses, Matron. We know. In a moment, Olivia de Havilland, Herbert Marshall, and Helen Chandler will return in Act Three of Vigil in the Night. During this brief intermission, we bring you our old friends, the Browning family. 17-year-old Dot and her younger sister, Midge, are studying in the living room as our scene opens. And there goes the telephone. I'll get it. Hello? Yes, this is Dot. Oh, hello, Mary Jane. What's new? Why, yes, I am, with Jim. You didn't? Oh, honey, what rotten luck. Why don't you come with us? I know, but it's a shame to miss it. Well, bye, and don't worry, honey. What goes on? It's Mary Jane, Midge. She didn't get a bid to the senior prom. Oh, gee, that's tough. And she's got that swell new dress. I know. She and Betty are the only girls in the class who didn't get bids. Poor kids. They're always missing out on things. And they never know why. They're pretty and they've got loads of pep. Oh, well, I guess they don't realize you have to be awfully careful about daintiness. Oh, how about some shut-eye, Midgie? Okay. Night, Mother. Good night, girls. 
And don't forget to lux your things. <laughs> we won't, darling. Gee, you're a swell mother. <laughs> <laughs> so much appreciation all of a sudden. <laughs> well, I'm awfully glad you taught us all the nice things about being dainty. Like, like luxing undies and everything. My dear, you know, I want you girls to be popular and happy and have loads of good times. And it's so important to be dainty and sweet. I know. You know, I feel awfully sorry for Betty and Mary Jane. I wish there was some way of telling them. Mother Browning is right, isn't she? Daintiness is the very foundation of charm. And a wise mother helps her daughters to have this lovely quality. She reminds them of how easy it is to lux under things after every wearing. To lux dresses, blouses, and accessories often. Especially with the new quick lux. Because it's so fast, so easy to use, and so thorough. These quick suds just float away every trace of perspiration. Yet they're so gentle, they keep washable colors and fabrics new looking longer. Lux, you know, is safe for everything, safe in water alone. Keep a big box. That size is extra economical, you know. Keep it handy in the bathroom as your charm insurance. New Quick Lux comes in the same familiar box at no extra cost to you. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on the third act of Vigil in the Night. The isolation ward. Long rows of iron beds stretch endlessly into the murky gloom. Air thick with the odor of antiseptics. Hot, humid, cut off from the world by a single door through which the sick enter but rarely leave. Here is the battleground against cerebrospinal fever. Here, Anne and Lucy have taken up the stand against death. This one. He's not responding to treatment, Doctor. I've been watching him. I'm afraid you'll have a bed empty in the morning. Another? That makes 14 since yesterday. Anne, don't you realize what you're up against here? Not by practical experience. Well, you should. It's more virulent than the worst form of tropic plague. Don't be afraid to use antiseptic. Keep your mask on when treating a patient. Be careful, Anne, please. I will. I know that work like this is your whole life, but you might be able to crowd something in on the side, too. We, we could work together always. Are you trying to say... You know what I'm trying to say. That's why you must be careful. For me. Will you... Will you be careful, too, please? Very. Anne... And Nurse Dunn and some of the other nurses are in the court. They want to see you. Right there. What can they want? Nora. Glenn. We're sorry, Anne. We should have been here sooner. But we're reporting now. Oh, come in. How many are you? Eight of us, ready for anything. Come on, girls. Hello. Hello, Anne. Hello. 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 Oh, it's Hello. wonderful. Hello. And can we use you? Report to Lucy. She'll give you the routine. Right, oh. Good evening, Nurse Lee. Why, Nurse Gray, you're quite well, I see. Matron said I might come here if you'll have me. I'd like to work with you, Nurse Lee. I'd like to make up for what I... Please, come in, Nurse Gray. We need every fine nurse we can get. Thank you. Thank you. Anne, what's going on here? Haven't you heard? We're building a new children's ward, matron. Partitions for the beds, windows. We need them badly. Who ordered it? Who's paying for it? I ordered it, and Matthew Bowley will pay. He doesn't know it yet, but I charged everything to him. And when they find out about this and you have to go to prison, we'll all go with you. That's nice of you, Matron. But I hope that won't happen until the epidemic's over. Will you please leave now? Really, Anne, who is Matron here? Hepperton is going to need you long after this epidemic is over. And if you're a party to this, you won't be here. I appreciate your consideration, but I lack your confidence. I've already been reading the pages in the nursing journal. 
headed situations vacant. And, and Matthew Bowley's here. He's coming across the court. Take over the ward. I'll see him. Right on. Good afternoon, Mr. Bowley. You're quite a stranger around here these days. Look here, young woman. I want to know the meaning of these bills. Are those the bills for the work I ordered to be done? So, you admit you bought up half the town and calm as you please sent the bills in for the committee to pay. Certainly. It had to be done. And unfortunately, a nurse's salary is hardly sufficient to finance the expenses for an epidemic. Young lady, you know what you've done is a criminal offence? I only know that people are dying and that other people like you aren't raising a finger to stop it. We needed a new children's ward, and we've got it. And though it probably means less than nothing to you, that room will keep children alive. Oh, I've been insulted enough by you. You won't talk so big when you find yourself behind prison bars, me girl. Would you be good enough not to shout, Mr. Bowling? We have some very sick people in here. Oh, Matron, and you in this too? Matron knew nothing of this. I happen to be in charge here, and I'm solely responsible. You're responsible? Well, yes, I am. Do you hear that, Mr. Bowley? That's the ambulance. They're bringing in another one. We hear it all day long and all hours of the night. Now, don't try to beg the question, young woman. Dishonesty is dishonesty and stealing stealing. I'm sorry, but you can't... Matt! Matt! It's Mrs. Bowley. They told me you were here, Matt. He's got it, the boy. They're taking him in there, in that ward. The boy? What? It can't be. It can't be. They brought him here to this horrible place. I've got to see him. You're not allowed in there. You mean we can't see him? I'm sorry, Mr. Bowley. All infectious cases must be isolated. Nurse. Nurse. Is there any news? I'm My afraid. little girl. I'm afraid you'll have to wait, Mr. North, with the others. There's Dr. Prescott. Dr. Prescott. Dr. Prescott, Dr. Prescott. Dr. Prescott. Dr. Prescott. Dr. Prescott. Dr. Prescott. Dr. Prescott. I'm sorry. I don't know any more than you. There'll be a bulletin in about an hour. Please be patient, everyone. Oh, oh, Dr. Prescott, I'm glad you're here. You should be glad. It must warm your heart to see these people, Mr. Bowley. No, Doctor, I'm glad because... Well, because we've got such confidence in you. It's a little late for that. This is the result of your handiwork. You were warned time and time again that this would happen, but you didn't care. We begged you for the means to prevent it, but you blocked us at every turn. Ah, good business. Saved your money. Well, look at those faces. Fathers and mothers of dying children. Pitiful, isn't it? Oh, if only there was some way to make you suffer. To make you feel what... I know, I know, Prescott. My boy's in there. Cerebro. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll take a look at him. Thank you, Doctor, but look at me, boy. I, I'm an off to get this, but when his turn comes... All right, Bowley. We'll do our best. Well, Doctor, did you examine the Bowley boy? Yes. What chance has he got? One in a hundred. Who's on duty here tonight? Lucy. I am, Doctor. Keep a close watch on the boy, Lucy. Use ice packs regularly. And if the temperature continues to rise, double the intramuscular injections. Yes, sir. Lucy... Would you like me to stay with him? No, I'll get along all right. You go to bed, Anne. Keep your mask on. Don't get too near. <coughs> Good night. Good night. Watch him. Watch him. Change the ice pack. Don't take your eyes off him. Listen to him breathe. Oh, poor little boy. Don't let him die. Oh, he mustn't die. Watch him. Watch him. Count every breath. Is it weaker? Watch him. Oh, remember the other boy. Remember. Oh, what's happened? His breathing stopped. Oxygen. Oh, breathe. Oh, why doesn't he breathe? It's no good. It's no good. Breathe into his mouth. That works. Make him breathe with your own breath. Lucy, Lucy, what are you doing? That boy has cerebro. His breath is alive with it. Get away. No, don't. Don't breathe into his mouth. You'll get it too, Lucy. Don't. Against 
leave yesterday, ten the day before, and we've got Cerebro licked. The Bowley child's out of danger. Matt Bowley was in this morning. I think you're going to get that new hospital doctor. I know. I spoke to him. The sky's the limit now. Oh, it's marvelous. Isn't it funny how things work out? All your plans, everything you've wanted. Not quite everything yet. I still can't figure out how you're going to go on nursing and manage a household at the same time. <laughs> That's my problem, doctor. <laughs> Anne, come right away. What's the matter? It's Lucy. She's in her room. She's sick. I, I, I think it's Cerebro. <laughs> Tell me. You've got to tell me. Anne, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to say. Lucy can't live. Oh, no. She has a fulminant form of cerebro. She won't respond. Oh. Anne. Anne. Yes, dear. Anne. Some water. Here, darling. No, don't try to move. Thank you. Anne, I'm glad I came here with you. I'm not much good now, but I... You'll be up and working again before you know it. Oh, not this time. And you remember the boy at Cheerham? Yes, darling. I wrote the matron and I told her everything. But lucky, wasn't it, that I had a chance to get back a life for the one I lost? And that sort of makes me even, doesn't it? Yes, darling. You know, Anne, I'm beginning to think I was a pretty good nurse. Lucy. Lucy! Poor Lucy. Poor darling. And I stood there, helpless. I stood there and watched her die. Your fine Dr. Prescott. The great doctor who wanted you to work with him. It wasn't your fault. You did everything you could. And it wasn't enough. I brought that child back here to her death. She'd have been alive today if it hadn't been for me. Oh, Anne, I failed you so. No, no. The years I've worked for knowledge, the years I've studied to save lives, to breathe on a fragile spark to keep it burning. And when a time comes to help someone I love, I fail. I'm helpless. I've learned nothing. I can do nothing. You're wrong. You mustn't be bitter. And it isn't futile. It's glorious. We work for all. Some live and some die. How often we've seen two people, both with the same disease, come into the hospital, both with the same power of resistance. And yet, during the night, one dies and the other lives. It isn't science. It isn't medicine. It's something more. Someone who watches and reasons who is to live and who is to die. It's not for us to be bitter and criticize his judgment. We're here to serve. And if we do it well, we find happiness inside ourselves. The perfect happiness that Lucy knew when she left us. Dr. Prescott, you wanted in surgery at once. Emergency, Doctor. Better get ready, Prescott. They brought in 11 men already. Explosion at the lake from mine. They'll have more for us in a few minutes. Nurse Wilde, prepare the accident ward. Move all convalescents and bring in all the extra beds you can find. Yes, Nurse Lee. Doctor, are you ready now? I... I think so. Come, Doctor. There's work for us to do. just a moment, Mr. DeMille returns with our stars. While we're waiting, here's our good friend Libby Collins with some advice for the women in our audience. It's very timely advice, too. During the next few weeks, while you're concentrating on your summer wardrobe, don't overlook your hands. Would you promise me that? Think of them as part of your costume. They really are, you know, because people notice hands so much more when you're wearing light colors and short sleeves. If they're rough and red, they can stick out like, well, like a sore thumb. Thanks, Libby. You're right. You know, speaking as a mere man, 
I can tell you men do think unattractive hands spoil the lovely picture of a woman that a woman should always make. Well, it's easy to avoid unattractive hands now, even though you do dishes every day. We've proved that conclusively by the famous one-hand tests of five leading soaps, including Lux. Hundreds of women made these tests, dipping one hand in Lux suds, the other in suds from another soap, under conditions similar to home dishwashing. After several weeks had gone by, their Lux hands were still smooth and white, the other hands rough, red, and ugly looking. The test proved Lux kindest to hands. No wonder women say, I'll stick to new quick Lux for dishes, and no substitutes, thank you. Now that's good advice to follow this summer. Use gentle new quick Lux for your dishes to help your hands stay smooth and white so they look lovely with your pretty summer dresses. New quick Lux costs so little to use, and it's so fast so mild and pure. It comes in the same familiar box at no extra cost. Here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Olivia de Havilland and Herbert Marshall lay aside the white garb of Hepperton Hospital to return to our microphone. And we salute two fine performers. Thank you, C.B. Perhaps vigil in the night is the kind of reminder we all should have now and then. A reminder of the service to receive from the medical and nursing professions. The men and women in white are pretty quiet about it themselves. I'm glad you put the women in white right alongside the men, Bart. That's where you'll find them when they're needed. The women in white couldn't have had a more sincere spokesman, well, well spokeswoman, than you or... I suppose almost every girl at one time or another decides she wants to be a nurse. She may imagine herself as another Florence Nightingale, or she may just think she looked pretty in a white uniform. But the girls that stick to it, well, they have what it takes. But it's still a great help to the patient if they do look pretty in a white uniform. I think you're both right. <laughs> a very diplomatic answer, Mr. DeMille. What play are you going to have here next week? Next Monday night, Olivia. We present Alice Fay, Robert Preston, and Ray Milland in Alexander's Ragtime Band. Our play is adapted from the 20th Century Fox screen hit and woven into the romantic story are all those familiar tunes by Irving Berlin, which you've been humming down through the te years. To borrow a line from the first of these songs, we hope you'll all come on and hear Alexander's Ragtime Band next Monday night with Alice Fay, Ray Milland, and Robert Preston. Alexander's Ragtime Band is a great show, CB, and you have a great cast. Good night. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Mm. Good night. Uh, would you write a description for more parts here for you, too? Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Alice Fay, Robert Preston, and Ray Milan in Alexander's Ragtime Band. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Frederick Warlock as Mr. Bowley, Ethel Griffiths as Matron East, Inez Seabury as Nora, Eric Snowden as Dr. Cayley, Claire Vadera as Mrs. Sullivan, Lou Merrill as Coroner, Helena Grant as Nurse Gregg, Marie Blake, Gloria Gordon as Mrs. Merchant, Lee Congdon as Nurse, and Thomas Mills, Dick Ryan, Douglas Scott, Joe Panario, Paul Hilton, and Ian Wong. Herbert Marshall will soon be seen in the Walter Wanger foreign correspondent. He has just started work in the letter at Warner Brothers. We're proud to say that the Lux Radio Theater has just been selected as the leading dramatic program on the air in the year conducted by the Women's National Radio Committee. On behalf of the sponsor and the Lux Radio Theater staff, we wish to thank all women throughout the country who took part in this poll. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is our broadcasting system. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.